So today, we're shifting attention a little bit uh, from these large issues, right? These kind of uh, large uh, project plan, uh, functionary, bureaucratic, technocratic issues that were at stake in the Vansay conference. And instead, we're going to focus on two uh, particular figures, two particular individuals, uh, in order to begin to try to understand and unpack a little bit more about uh, who these Nazis were from the perspective of as much as we can piece together about uh, their own uh, life histories, their goals, uh, their desires, who they were, how they behaved, their outlook, um, and try to understand something about uh, two major Nazi officials, uh, the two people that we'll talk about being Adolf Eichmann and um, Karl Hawker. Um, so I asked you to look at um, a couple of pieces, uh, one which details um, details the impressions that a very famous German Jewish philosopher by the name of Hannah Arendt had of the Eichmann trial uh, in 1961, impressions that she had of Adolf Eichmann, trying to understand who he was as a person. And I also asked you to look at a photo book, um, and it's a really extraordinary document um, that's in the collections of the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, it's a photo book taken in the summer and fall of 1944 uh, by a mid-ranking SS officer by the name of Karl Hocker. And it basically covers about six months of his time in Auschwitz. Uh, basically, and from the perspective, largely, not the perspective of the victims, but from the perspective of the perpetrators. And I thought these two documents together, uh, meaning um, the transcripts, uh, well, some of the transcripts and testimony of Eichmann, and uh, this historically specific document of the photographs of Auschwitz would help us to understand something of the perspective of the perpetrators. Um, so that's basically the goal of uh, the lecture today. Yeah, we're going to go and talk about uh, Adolf Eichmann. And um, the case of Adolf Eichmann is really um, one of the most uh, fascinating and disturbing in terms of uh, famous high-ranking Nazi officials uh, who played an instrumental and critical role in carrying out uh, the genocide. Uh, um, his case is, I think, all the more complicated in some ways because of the way in which he went into hiding after the war, the fact that he assumed a false identity uh, for many years while in hiding in Argentina, um, that he was apprehended uh, by Israeli Mossad agents, um, taken to trial in Jerusalem, charged on 15 counts uh, of including crimes against humanity and crimes against the Jewish people and abetting and aiding in genocide, and was actually hung uh, by uh, the State of Israel in 1962, uh, which was actually the first and only time that they had carried out the death penalty uh, for a criminal. Um, the case of Eichmann is also interesting because in the four months of his testimony and his trial, he talked extensively about um, his own background. He talked extensively about what motivations he had to do what he did, his role in the Nazi machinery. And, uh, and you began to get a picture of someone who was not just a Nazi bureaucrat and not just a sadistic killer, um, in fact, not a sadistic killer at all, but actually a very competent and relatively keen uh, business-minded person. Um, and this was really quite extraordinary because, in many ways, this portrayal of Eichmann and uh, this kind of getting to know Eichmann very much stood in contrast to the idea that people had up until then and maybe even continue to have now about Nazis, meaning they were thought to be kind of sadistic thugs, uh, absolutely crazed lunatics who were so consumed by their racism and their hatred and their violence and their brutality, all they could do was just kill Jews. And in the case of Eichmann, it was actually very different. He actually even said, I never killed a single person with my hand, neither Jew nor non-Jew. I did not kill anybody. And that's pretty astounding because, in fact, it's true. He never killed a single person with his own hand. And that raised a very fundamental problem for how to adjudicate genocide. What then did he do? What then was he guilty of? Right? How do you charge someone for crimes against humanity, crimes of genocide, if in fact that person never killed a single person with their own hand? And this kind of presented a really fundamental paradox, really a fundamental difficulty of trying to understand genocide. 
And this, I think, in many ways, kind of consolidated uh, one of the very big problems that we've been talking about, which is the tremendous bureaucracy and buy-in that was necessary to carry out the Holocaust. It wasn't a single person who did the killings. It wasn't even a small group. Uh, but in fact, it was a very large hierarchical bureaucratic system. Hierarchical in the sense that you had many different layers, but also very latitudinous, very widespread, very horizontal. So that different people did different things, and all in concert, all working together, something happened. And that, of course, was a genocide. So Eichmann, um, the quote I gave you at the top there, is actually an interesting quote that he made in 1950. And it was, uh, he was in Argentina in, in hiding. Uh, many uh, high-ranking Nazi officials fled uh, Nazi Germany if they were able to get out uh, when the end was near. So basically at the end of the war, um, many committed suicide. Uh, others were captured. In the case of Eichmann and Mengele, two of the most famous uh, Nazi criminals, both uh, went into hiding, fled under false identity papers, managed to get into Argentina, lived a life in the underground, um, assumed a new identity, a new name, uh, began a new job, uh, took on a new look, uh, essentially went into hiding. And in the 1950s, he made these private recordings uh, that he didn't think would ever become public. He thought that these were for himself. They were almost like diaries. And uh, he was, rec he was uh, calling about the end of the war and talking, um, he said, talking to my men in my Berlin office. And this is uh, towards the end of the war. And uh, he basically said, uh, with regard to what he was doing, um, if it has to be, I told them, I will gladly jump into my grave in the knowledge that five million enemies of the Reich have already died like animals. Um, meaning, in this case, the enemies of the Reich are the Jews, and they've died like animals. And it has an interesting kind of um, passivity to it. It doesn't say who did it. It doesn't say who did the killing. It says they died like animals, which is something that I think is exactly correct in terms of what we've been talking about. Mass death, anonymous death, essentially treating people not as humans, but as, as being murdered in a group. Uh, they're not people that he's talking about. They're enemies of the Reich. And these enemies of the Reich for him are basically people that have been reduced to something else. In this case, animals, or as some kind of object to be, uh, to be exterminated. Um, that's where he was in 1950. Prior to that, um, one of the things you may have read from Hannah Arendt uh, is that Eichmann uh, was a relatively, I mentioned this in class as well last time, Eichmann was the lowest ranking official to take place, uh, to participate in the Wannsee Conference. Um, he was underneath of Heydrich, but he was significantly lower in rank, and in fact was significantly less experienced with the day-to-day -day activity of war. He wasn't on the front. He wasn't someone who was in charge of uh, killings. He wasn't someone who was uh, in charge of creating laws. Um, he was someone that was there because he had kind of an insider knowledge about the Jewish people, largely from studies that he undertook himself uh, in the mid-1930s. These studies were largely based on assumptions about race, uh, mo motivated, I think, uh, by trying to figure out almost an answer, I guess you might say, to the Jewish question prior to the actual carrying out of the Holocaust. That is to say, kind of casting about for ways to deal with this quote unquote problem. Um, and in that regard, he came up with a number of options. And these options were things like facilitating the immigration of Jews. And here, this is not euphemistic, this is, this is actual. That is facilitating them moving out of German territory, essentially a kind of expulsion. Um, and this basically meant um, a kind of uh, stripping of belongings, stripping of their houses, of their cars, of their assets, um, essentially a kind of rational, what was called sort of a rational race policy. And this was put in place before the war. Uh, this is around 1938, uh, early 1939. Um, it's a policy that Eichmann was charged with, and it was, he was charged with this largely because he had studied and sort of knew about customs and beliefs and the religion of the Jews. So he was in charge of this office mainly to facilitate immigration. Um, this was forced immigration, I should say. This is not voluntary. Um, or it was certainly coerced. Um, in 1940, and this is also prior to the Vansay Conference, prior to the systematic uh, elements of the Holocaust, he had worked on a plan to ship uh, four million European Jews to Madagascar. Uh, 
uh, sounds ridiculous, uh, an island off the coast of Africa that suddenly would be populated with four million Jews who had been uh, expeditiously shipped off there, uh, as if they could be kind of removed in some ways. Um, this plan was never put into practice. Um, he had articulated it. Uh, he had tried to get funding for it. He had tried to get buy-in for it. Um, that, in fact, didn't happen. Um, but in 1941, things began to shift, and it largely shifted because of the war effort, and largely shifted because of things outside of his office. Um, you already know that as the front uh, increased both in the east and the west, Germany absorbed uh, a tremendous number of new Jews into its, uh, into its uh, Lebensraum, into its living space. Um, and you also know that you had uh, the instrumentation, uh, instrumentalization of Einsatzkommandos, these mobile killing units, going through and systematically uh, annihilating parts of the population in areas that were conquered by the Nazis. You also have the first experimentations with gassing. This was not done under Eichmann's supervision, not done under his office. Um, this was a separate uh, part of the Nazi bureaucracy to sort of deal with and come to terms with and think about carrying out those elements that would then become centralized uh, under the Holocaust, or what we know to be the Holocaust. It really wasn't until January 20th, 1942, if, if Von Se meant anything for anybody, it meant something very significant for Eichmann. And it meant something very significant for him because it's at this moment that he was charged with doing something extraordinary. Basically, he, at that moment, was given the blessing by the highest ranking officials of the Nazi party to facilitate the deportation of the Jews from all of Europe to death camps and concentration camps. Uh, he was basically given that charge. It's sort of like, this is your mission. Uh, I am giving you this task. And it's an extraordinary task to be given, right? You're given a task which is so monumental, so grand, so, so almost hysterically grand, right? Um, he's given this task. And it's at that moment that there's a fundamental turning point in not just Eichmann's career, but also a fundamental turning point in how the Holocaust would be carried out. So you know, people often say that von Se was really not a very significant date because it was already predetermined that they were going to annihilate the Jews. They're already doing so. All that's true. But it was a very important date for Eichmann because it's at that point that he got his papers of what to do. He got basically his job. He got his blessing to carry it out. He worked very hard. Between 1942 and 1945, because of his background in um, business, his background in kind of meticulous detail and bookkeeping, he was basically a bookkeeper. Um, he was a very good one. Uh, he was a very good coordinator. He was a very good project manager. Uh, essentially, he was, that's probably the best way to put it, he was the project manager for the deportation of the Jews of Europe. Um, an extraordinary job to be given. Um, head of the office concerned with organizing the registration, the expropriation, the rounding up and deportation of Jews from Germany, Austria, France, Holland, Belgium, Slovakia, Greece, Italy, and Hungary. Uh, a massive number of people. Uh, extraordinary. Uh, and he played a role in facilitating the deportation to major death camps and concentration camps, which were almost all located in Poland. Um, he personally, and this is 1944, he personally oversaw the deportation of 437,000 Hungarians to Auschwitz, almost all to Auschwitz, uh, in a course of eight weeks. This is where Elie Wiesel uh, was w one among those, those uh, people. So Eichmann, um, an interesting person um, because of this role that he played. Um, just a little bit more about his trial, and then we'll talk about Hannah Arendt and sort of the way in which we want to understand this person, understand him. Um, he was living under the name of Ricardo Clement in 1960 when Israeli Mossad agents uh, were tracking him. They knew what bus he took. They, they basically had figured out where more or less he went during the day. He had a very uh, rhythmic pattern to his life uh, in Argentina. Uh, he had assumed a new identity. He had a new look. Uh, he was difficult to track down. He had moved from place to place. Um, but um, he was abducted. He was brought to, to stand trial in Jerusalem. Um, the Israeli attorney Gen general, a man named Gideon Hausner, had brought the charge of accounts, the charges against him, uh, largely crimes against humanity. And you know from Samantha Power's book that even the, the charge of crimes against humanity was a relatively new thing. Uh, this was a, an invention largely of the Holocaust because they needed to come up with a term 
to describe crimes that were so grand and so huge that a single person couldn't possibly be responsible for them. They were crimes committed by a state against a minority living either within that state or a minority living within other states that that state had taken over. His trial began uh, in April 1961, and uh, some of the interesting things, and this comes from Hannah Arendt's observations about Eichmann, is that Eichmann claimed that he was basically a transmitter. Um, that is to say, he transmitted orders. Uh, he sent them from place to place. He claimed that he was a coordinator. Uh, he found good people to uh, move trains. He found people who would be in charge of putting together um, deportations. He made schedules. Uh, he made sure the trains essentially, as the stereotype goes, ran on time. He facilitated. And he said that he never did anything that was against his superiors. That is, his superiors had given him the blessing to do it, and he said, I carried out those tasks. I carried them out exquisitely well. He carried them out to the T. Um, and in fact, and this is the interesting thing as well, he claims that he never had killed a single person, and so standing trial essentially for murder made no sense. He said, I didn't murder anybody. I did not raise my hand. I did not bring a knife. I did not drop gas. I did not, pl um, I did not plunder. I did not actively kill a single person. It wasn't his hand. He was just following orders. And this mantra repeated over again, over and over again. I was just following orders. I was following orders. And not only that, he made point about legality. He said, what I was doing was within the letter of the law. The law said this. I was acting according to the law. The law of my country was this. My superiors said to do that. I obeyed my superiors. And not only that, I obeyed them and stayed within the law. I basically am a law-abiding citizen. That's his argument. So why was he found guilty on 15 charges? Why was he found guilty of crimes against humanity? What did he, as an individual, do? How could he be charged, right? I mean, on what legal basis could you bring charges against Eichmann? What do you think, I mean, this is an interesting question. I mean, what do you think the prosecution could say? That's the defense. There's his defense. What could the prosecution say? On what grounds do you bring charges against this person? How do you argue it? If you're a lawyer, how do you argue this case? OK, so first thing you have to do is you have to get rid of this idea that you're following the law, right? Because the idea here is that the law, essentially, of your country, which happened to be Nazi law, it cannot be universalized as the law for all humankind. So he's operating under the assumption that this law um, is universalizable, and it's not. Uh, a universalizable law, especially as been put down by the United Nations, and this happened in 1948, is a law which recognizes human dignity, not a law which exterminates a group of people or a minority. So the very first thing that had to be done by the prosecution is to recognize that the law of the land, as it existed in 1939, 1945, so forth, this was the law of Germany, but it's not a universalizable law. That law does not apply. Um, instead, there are these other kind of meta laws, you might say, that can be universalized. And those laws are based on respect, human dignity, and, um, and essentially tolerance. OK, so that's one thing the prosecution did. How else did the prosecution respond? Yeah. Intent. So the issue here is you, so you, can you be charged based on your intent versus your actions? Um, it's an interesting question, too. I mean, clearly he did have, I think he expressed intent, um, certainly intent to participate in a system. But he also would argue, and this is to go, just to show you to the other side, he argued that um, he didn't really know where they were going. He knew they were going to, um, he knew they were going to these certain places, but he didn't know what was happening. He wasn't physically there to see them gassed. Uh, he said he, he got them together. He made sure they got on trains. He coordinated. Uh, he made sure that all the pieces fit together, but he wasn't really there in the death camps as people were gassed. So could he really have known what was happening? Right. I mean, that's, uh, and even there, you know, we also could go, I mean, the, the prosecutor, or sorry, his, his defense would argue, 
it was all euphemistic. I mean, if, did evacuation mean death? Did, uh, deep, did expulsion mean you know, gassing? Um, but you're right about the, other, the first point. The prosecution argued that the role here that you played was aiding and abetting genocide. And that was a term that they used, aiding and abetting genocide. Um, in fact, that's a, a role in Samantha Power's book that becomes the basis of one of the grounds for adjudicating genocide is not just you physically murdering someone else or dropping gas or cutting someone's throat, but the role of a facilitator in aiding and abetting, basically making it possible, right? So you're essentially facilitating something by making it possible, creating the conditions of possibility to carry something out. And that Eichmann was found guilty of. So basically, that you're basically making the argument that uh, once you are sort of bought into the hierarchy of the system, you, you're responsible, so to speak, for your actions because you're, even though you may not have been the person who actually carried it out, you're already within a system, and that system makes you responsible for everything below and sort of above you. I mean, it's a, essentially that is a similar argument that was used uh, with Eichmann as well. Um, so the fact that he was obedient and obeying and listening to his superiors didn't actually abdicate him of responsibility, but made him responsible. Um, yeah, what else? Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, one wonders. Uh, one, I think that's, that's, a, that's a great question. I'm, it's, not, yeah, it's not really clear because Eichmann in many ways became a somewhat of a symbol. Oops, sorry. Eichmann became a, a symbol uh, in many ways of the Nazi regime. I mean, he became in 1961 also, I mean, largely because, I mean, the superiors were, were all dead. I mean, Hitler had killed himself, Goebbels had killed himself, Himmler, uh, Goring, all, all dead. Uh, so you have, uh, you know, in terms of masterminds that are still alive, Eichmann and Mengele are probably the two biggest uh, people that, uh, that, were, that had fled. The idea that they could be brought to justice, a significant thing. He became somewhat of a symbol for um, justice that hadn't been served yet, right? Um, you can't do justice to the dead in some ways. I mean, you can't try a dead person, uh, but you can try a living person. And that was actually one of the critical things about Eichmann's trial. And this is interesting. He was kept within a glass bulletproof case uh, the whole time that he was on trial. And the reason, I think, and it's, a, it's interesting, you can think of all, all the reasons. I mean, they were afraid, obviously, that someone would try to kill him. They would try to kill him before he actually was tried. And they were also afraid that he would be killed before he actually testified to what he had done. And so, essentially, having this living witness who was a, not just a witness in the sense of a bystander just watching, but a living participant, right, who could be put on trial, that was critical because there were so few at this level that still were alive. There are plenty, plenty, thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of Nazi mid-level bureaucrats that were alive who had gone through various trials. Almost none of them served a significant amount of time. Um, Karl Hocker, who is the guy we'll talk about next, uh, SS officer in Auschwitz, served uh, a couple of years in prison and then worked as a cashier at a, at a bank. Uh, very common. Most of the mid-level Nazi officials served three to, three to 10 years, uh, some 15. A few served life, and even fewer were actually executed for their crimes. Um, it's extraordinary. Uh, actually, we'll go through at one point in the class the, the figures for people who actually were tried and brought to justice. And you have an extraordinary disparity between the people that actually stood trial and were found guilty and had to pay for their crimes, either by time in jail or by death, and the sheer number of victims. Um, we, have a, we know there's less than 1,000 that were, that, really, that, that were killed because of, I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head, it may be a couple hundred. Um, but we're talking about millions of victims and a couple hundred who were brought to trial um, in, a significant, uh, in a significant fashion like Eichmann. So he became in some ways more of a symbol, I would say. Um, let me show you this uh, little clip real quick. Um, I'm gonna see if I can get you, but I'll put this, this speaker up to it. So this is a, a short news clip uh, from the United States um, when Eichmann was found guilty. And um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just leave this on. I know it, you might not be able to see it perfectly, but I think you'll be fine. <laughs> the story that had a grim preface in the horror of Nazi concentration camps comes to an equally grim end in Israel as Adolf Achmann is sentenced for his crimes against humanity. Defense attorney Robert Savacious will automatically appeal, but this is the end for Eichmann, who was seized in Buenos Aires in 1960 and spirited to Israel. 
Three judges started to study the evidence when the four-month trial ended in August and found Eichmann guilty on 15 counts of the indictment. In his bulletproof booth, Eichmann sits stoically as the charges are summed up. The unseen witnesses against this former Gestapo colonel are the six million Jews he is convicted of slaughtering. The judges then call on the defendant to stand as they pass their sentence. The end of a trail of blood and horror. The end of a man whose name will be written in infamy. The man who escaped the Nuremberg war trials by fleeing to South America receives justice at the hands of the people whom he had aimed to wipe out. Actually, one facing us. Uh, I just wanted to say something about his uh, appearance and his uh, his look. There you go. Um, a couple of things that I think are remarkable, uh, and this kind of goes to Hannah Arendt, and I'll talk about that now. Um, he's a perfectly competent-looking person. Uh, he's dressed in a tie, a suit. Um, he systematically and very competently answered questions that were put toward him. Um, he was tested by psychologists to see if he was insane. Uh, they determined that he wasn't insane at all. They determined that he was perfectly sane, perfectly fit to stand trial. He was articulate. He was thoughtful. He paused when he thought about his answers. Um, he wore glasses, as you can see, so that he could read documents that were brought before him. They brought about 1,500 documents before him, uh, as at least the, um, the prosecution brought numerous 1,500 documents to the trial. Numerous witnesses came by who either saw him, knew him, uh, or who were affected by his actions. Um, he basically continued to say that I was a transmitter. I was a facilitator. Uh, I followed orders. Uh, I didn't kill anybody with my own hand. And basically, I was answering to a law, a different law. I was doing everything legal. And if I'm guilty at all, I'm guilty, he says, before God, not before this court. Um, and it was a really interesting quote. Guilty, he said, if I'm guilty at all, if in any way I'm guilty, and he questioned whether he was. He wasn't clear about his guilt. Uh, if I am guilty, I'm not guilty before this court or before these charges. I'm guilty before God. And that's uh, an interesting comment. I'm not even entirely sure how to interpret it, but that's, um, that was uh, the one moment, so to speak, of acknowledgment of guilt that, uh, that Eichmann that Eichmann had. So let's, um, yeah, so that takes us to Hannah Arendt. And I want to say a little something about who she was, um, because uh, you, may not, you may not have heard of her before, but um, I provided you with um, a short piece in the course reader called Eichmann in Jerusalem uh, on the Banality of Evil, uh, which is uh, essentially a report that she wrote after attending Eichmann's trial. And uh, she was uh, herself probably the most famous German Jewish philosopher, certainly of the 20th century, maybe of, maybe period. Um, she fled Nazi Germany in 1933. Uh, she eventually ended up in the United States and took up a teaching post at Princeton University. Uh, she was the author of numerous books on the human condition and was profoundly influenced by the Holocaust. She was a philosopher who was trying to understand the centrality of destruction and totalitarianism for the 20th century. It's like, what's the meaning of this? Or, or what's the lack of meaning? What does it mean for our thought about what it means to be a human being? And uh, the most famous book she wrote, which is one I, I highly recommend. I mean, I didn't give you any, any sections in, in the course reader of this, but maybe you've seen it in other classes or you've come across it, called The Origins of Totalitarianism. It's a large book because the origins of totalitarianism are complicated. Um, but she traces, she's trying to understand two things in this book. One, the Holocaust, and second, the Gulag, uh, basically uh, Stalinist uh, exterminations. And she basically thinks that totalitarianism is not just an invention of the 20th century, something that becomes a central part of uh, Europe uh, and, uh, and Asia in the 20th century, but it's something that has deep roots that stretch back to the 19th and 18th century. And those roots are to be found in the history of colonization, racial thinking, uh, the conquest and cutting a part of Africa. Um, and finally, what she calls kind of industrial modernity, where people are turned into atomized, isolated, fragmented selves, separated from one another, 
so that we can treat people not as human beings, but instead treat them as objects to be dispensed or, or dealt with in different ways. Um, she goes to Jerusalem in 1960, uh, 1962 and listened to the trial um, of, of Eichmann, excuse me, in 61, and um, reports on the trial. And she comes up with a thesis, which she calls the banality of evil. And the banality of evil essentially is just that, that Eichmann can be the most evil creature in the world in terms of what he did, in terms of his role of facilitating, but he's not the kind of sadistic, crazy, insane, perverted evil. He's utterly banal, meaning he's an everyday person. He's a father. He's, he's a son. He's a, he's a, he was a vacuum cleaner salesman, for crying out loud, prior to becoming a Nazi. I mean, you sold vacuum cleaners. That, that you were a, more or less a functionary. A pretty good soldier, but not really. Uh, a pretty good bookkeeper, but maybe not really. Um, he was an utterly banal, everyday figure, and yet assumed such a central and important role in the Nazi machinery. How do you understand that? And her thesis was that evil is not necessarily the thing that's most obvious, right? The, the most racist, sadistic, crazed, lunatic kind of person, but it can be utterly your neighbor. It can be anyone. It can be utterly banal. Origins of totalitarianism, just briefly. And I think this helps us a lot to understand something about her thinking about Eichmann and also the Holocaust. And uh, although, I'd, unfortunately, I'd love to give a whole class on, on Hannah Arendt, I, there's not enough time. But she's a very important thinker for us because she helps to articulate uh, the philosophical and kind of the human aspects and also the historical aspects of understanding the Holocaust. Uh, the origins of totalitarianism came out in 1951, just a few years after the horrors of the Holocaust became clear. And she basically looks to this genesis of the Holocaust. How did it happen? So you have to look at the history of anti-Semitism. You have to look at the history of racial thinking. You have to look at the history of conquest and imperialism. The idea of thinking of some people as being superior to others and other people being inferior. And you have to look towards modern society, which she thought cut people up into little atomized subjects. She argues that something happened in totalitarian societies in which people become, she calls them, superfluous. That is to say, extra, too much excess. Uh, essentially, Jews were turned into superfluous objects. Uh, they were not only dehumanized, but they could be dispensed with. And they could be dispensed with by the bureaucracy and the industrial means of modernity. And this is interesting as well. Trains, gassing, um, the, all the, the systematic electricity grids, all the communication, radio, technologies, telegraph, all the things that allowed the coordination to happen were also the products of modern society. That is to say, the Nazi genocide could not have been carried out in the way that it was carried out a century earlier because we didn't have the technology to carry it out. We didn't actually have the ability to network. Essentially, the networking aspect of society is an important part of what made possible the uh, genocide. Um, it's interesting, too, that uh, the Rwandan genocide although not about um, trains, was coordinated largely by the radio. Uh, essentially, announcements were made over the radio of when and where to do what. And so it's a modern technology galvanizing uh, a genocide in a very short period of time. She says that, in a couple of quotes I want to read, the goal of totalitarianism is to see to it that the victim never existed at all. It's a pretty chilling idea. It's a kind of, it, it indicates something about the absoluteness of the Nazi crimes. The idea is not simply to destroy people, but to destroy the idea that they ever existed in the first place. So it's destroying and destroying the memory of. It does both things. And that, for her, is absolutely critical for totalitarianism. She begins by thinking about how to understand this world. And one of the things I think we found from Primo Levi, from Ali Wiesel, even from Samantha Power, is how often what we're confronted with seems so out of this world. She calls it from another planet. It seems as if it's from another planet. It seems as if it came from somewhere else, but yet it's right here. And so she says, how do you understand this world in which everything is now possible, that, 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 that this could be possible, that this is a human potentiality? The genocide is a kind of a permanent possibility of the world we live in. Um, mass annihilation is a permanent possibility. 
She wonders, and this is an important for understanding Eichmann, she wonders how you talk about murder when you're no longer talking about a single person killing other people, but you're talking about what she calls the mass production of corpses. It's a strange phrase to use, the mass production of corpses. Basically, the Nazi death camps and labor camps basically were based on industrial means of production. Uh, very systematic, very organized, trains ran on time, people were funneled in, funneled out, cremated in a kind of regular cyclical cycle, um, in some ways much the same way that cars are made in a factory. That death camps became factory-like in terms of their efficiency. It's a very chilling idea to think that the way that you make cars or the way that you manufacture things, that that same logic, the same organizational logic, the efficiency, uh, the moving people in and out, uh, the effectiveness, the efficiencies, all those things could be put in the service of killing people. That's why it's mass production. Um, how do you talk about murder at that point? Murder traditionally is a single person killing someone else or perhaps killing a group of people. But you have an agent and you have victims that are very clearly delineated. Eichmann is somewhere in between. That is to say, he didn't actually kill people, but he facilitated something. And there are plenty of other facilitators just like him. Yeah. This we've seen with Primo Levi already, that death camps took away um, an individual's own death. I mean, amazing quotes, really ones that make you think. When there are no witnesses left, there can be no testimony. That's right. I mean, if everyone was killed, we would never be talking about this in the first place. Uh, the very fact that we have survivors who could talk about what they went through or we have testimonies that were written down, that's the very prerequisite of even having a class like this, of even talking about it. If the Nazi genocide was successful as they wanted it to be, we would never be talking about it because it basically would be it didn't happen. And that was their ultimate goal, right? The ultimate goal is the victims never existed. So it was to wipe out the memory that it actually happened. So this is her analysis. Um, I find it very compelling and really very thought-provoking. With regard to Eichmann, I, we mentioned a couple of things already. This comes from the course reader. I hope you had a chance to look at it. Um, she says, uh, and we talked about a couple of these things already, he never killed anybody, never raised a hand. He claims to be a law-abiding citizen. And if he's guilty of anything, and this is where the prosecution came in, and I think the significant uh, intervention the prosecution made was this issue of the way in which he facilitated, aided, and abetted genocide. That was the basis of the crime that he committed against humanity. That is, he played a central role in the administration of the crime, in the carrying of its carrying out. Amazingly, she thinks he's a completely normal person. Um, he's normal, not insane, not crazed even able to tell the difference between right and wrong. Uh, extraordinary, right? Uh, extraordinary because we, we want to think of, the, of, of him as something else. We almost want, it's almost safer and more palatable to think of Eichmann as he's just a crazed lunatic. He, he was crazy, he's out of his mind. And instead, what she's saying, he, w he had all his senses. He was very rational. He, in fact, was really good at what he did. He even claimed, and this was so extraordinary in Hannah Arendt's report, he even claimed not only to have Jewish relatives, distant relatives, um, but in fact to have had no hatred for the Jews. And then, like, how do you make sense of that? Because at, at, at one point we think, okay, you must have at least hated the Jews, right? At least you were consumed by your anti-Semitism that, that, that brought you to work every day, that motivated us to say, you know what? I, I do hate the Jews. Uh, but then he claimed he doesn't even hate the Jews. And so, like, what are you left with? At what point is it just he was just doing his work? You know, he's just following orders. So he says at the end, and this is the part I'm going to, I'll read from you from Hannah Arendt. She says, he says this at his trial um, when he was asked about the Vansay conference. And I had mentioned that that conference, maybe not a historical turning point in the Holocaust, but a significant turning point for Eichmann himself in terms of receiving his charge to, um, to facilitate um, the Holocaust. He said, um, and I'll read uh, from, from, from uh, Arendt, uh, she says that at the Vansay conference, the popes of the Third Reich met, meaning the people who were very high up, and Eichmann middle-ranked here, not really very high. Um, Heydrich, certainly a key fight figure, and given the go from Goring and, and Hitler, he says, at that moment, I sensed a kind of Pontius Pilate, uh, Pontius Pilate feeling. 
for I felt free of all guilt. She says, who was he to judge? Who was he to, quote, have thought his own thoughts in this manner? Well, he was neither the first nor the last to be ruined by modesty. At that moment, I sensed a kind of Pontius Pilate feeling, for I was free of all guilt. Who's Pontius Pilate? Anyone know? Yeah? Right. So um, this, was, this is a reference uh, that goes back to the crucifixion of Jesus, right? Um, Pontius Pilate uh, essentially said, I'm innocent of this man's blood, meaning of Jesus' blood. It's your responsibility, meaning the crowd, the people who were uh, the people essentially before Jesus. So Eichmann here is basically saying he's like Pontius Pilate. Uh, he's not the one that actually did the killing. It's the responsibility of other people. It's the responsibility maybe of the crowd. It's the responsibility of his superiors. It's the responsibility of other people. Uh, but it's not him. He was free of all guilt. Uh, he believed at the Vance Conference, he not only got his task to be the project manager of the Holocaust, to coordinate the trains, but they also allowed him to abdicate all guilt because they essentially had taken away his guilt by saying, this is uh, what we want you to do. We're bestowing this responsibility, this legality on you. And uh, he felt essentially uh, relieved. Other thoughts or comments about Eichmann? So it's a complex figure to understand. I mean, really, I think, uh, extraordinary in, some, in, in so many ways. Um, good. Let me turn to our... Our, our second part today, uh, which is a different person entirely, and um, perhaps not nearly as well, well, definitely not nearly as well known, um, but there we go. But uh, a really significant figure that perhaps provides, I think, some additional insight into who the Nazis were. So if Eichmann was someone who really didn't think he had any guilt, he didn't, wasn't responsible for his own actions, he was just a facilitator, almost a cog within a greater machine in some ways, although a critical cog, um, the story of Karl Hocher is the story of a mid-ranking SS officer stationed at Auschwitz in late 1944. Um, he was there when Primo Levi and Elie Wiesel were sent to Auschwitz. Uh, he was there at those moments when Auschwitz was actually operating at full capacity, uh, when you had thousands of people being brought on a daily basis to the death camp and exterminated uh, the same day. So this was the height of the, of the camp, and it was a few months, about six months, prior to its liberation in January by the Soviets, uh, and then, of course, the death marches that brought the survivors uh, from Auschwitz back into Germany. Karl Hocker was a mid-ranked SS officer stationed at the camp. Uh, he had worked there for about six months, and he had taken photographs. And the photographs that he took were not photographs of the victims, like the ones that you may be used to seeing, like the ones of victims standing on the train stations or emaciated bodies and the horror, uh, the kind of photos that we saw like in Night and Fog. But they were photographs basically of his life that he could probably show to his wife or his family, his kids, um, and he made a photo album that he bound together and he pasted the photos in there. And so uh, this photo album starts off uh, with him as uh, in his officer garb, as you can see, um, with uh, various uh, portraits and pictures of himself and his, among his superiors. The other thing that it shows, and this is, I think, really interesting and important is it also shows them, uh, the Nazi officers um, who were working in Auschwitz, relaxing. Uh, it shows them kind of on the off time. That is to say, they weren't working 24-7, at least not single. I mean, Auschwitz operated 24-7, but people who worked there worked in shifts. Um, that is to say, you might work eight hours, 10 hours, uh, a couple days a week, and so forth, but you didn't work every day, 24 hours a day. And so if you did a good job, if you did a good, uh, you put in a good effort, you were often rewarded within the SS bureaucracy. 
and you could go to a little, uh, a small town about 15 miles outside of Auschwitz where you could rest and relax. And uh, in fact, he spent a lot of time at this little town. It was like a spa uh, in some ways. And you could fraternize with uh, women and men, men and women could fraternize and hang out. You could eat, you could drink, you could listen to music. And basically on the off hours while people were being exterminated simultaneously, the SS officers um, enjoyed themselves like, like in this picture here. So this uh, photo album is basically a kind of uh, photo journey, you might say, through six months of Carl Hawker's life. Um, I'm going to dim the lights so you can see them a little better. Uh, yeah, this is um, one of them, I think, one of the really extraordinary photos uh, from 1944. It's raining outside. Um, they uh, have a man in, on the right-hand side with a uh, accordion. And this is, they're in this little town, this uh, spa town, um, uh, Solahuta is what it's called. And um, the caption reads, uh, the rain is coming from the bright sky. Um, Carl Hawker's in the center. Uh, that's him right there. Uh, these are female auxiliary, uh, auxiliaries who did various functions within concentration camps. Some were translators. Some had as assumed more like low-ranking, uh, these particular women had assumed relatively uh, low-ranking uh, jobs. They weren't uh, generals, uh, so to speak. They weren't the ones operating the death camps. Uh, I think they were at least according to the documentation we have here, they were translators. And uh, they also spent time with the SS officers who were um, more or less on a, a short vacation from their work that they were doing uh, during the day. Um, so this particular woman is, I mean, this, the, the pose, the kind of the fun that they're having, the playing of the accordion, the kind of giddiness um, indicates something about, I think, the amazing disjoint between what was going on 15 miles away in Auschwitz while the SS officers were out playing uh, and basically enjoying themselves. Um, here's another photograph um, also from 1944. Um, I'm gonna skip forward to a couple others. I'm particularly interested in, yeah, so we looked at this, uh, this sing-along photograph. Um, we go to here. This is uh, the resort, uh, the, the, the small, it's obviously in the forest, in the mountains. Uh, this is where they would go uh, when they had the opportunity to be relieved of their um, normal Auschwitz duties. Um, it was obviously a very pretty setting and, uh, and offered some rest and solace. The photographs are extraordinary uh, for a couple other reasons, is that you have the top officials, um, the most important ones, together. Um, this is uh, Richard Baer, who at that time was the commander of all of Auschwitz. Uh, this is um, the doctor, uh, Joseph Mengele, who is most known for the experiments that he carried out on prisoners in Auschwitz, the experiments he carried out on children, on twins, on gypsies, on Jews. Um, horrific experiments. I mean, ones that I don't even think I can detail because of the, the, the blood-chilling uh, horror of what he was doing. Uh, truly no regard whatsoever for human life, but basically using uh, victims as guinea pigs for medical experiments in which almost all were killed or suffered horrendous, horrific uh, injury. Um, Mengele was, was never found. He's someone who fled, and, uh, and we're not sure what became of him. Uh, and then the original camp commandant, uh, a man named, um, very, very famous, Rudolf Hess, uh, who is probably the most famous captured uh, commander because he was in charge of Auschwitz uh, for the majority of the time that Auschwitz operated. Uh, he was tried in 1947 by Polish officials, found guilty, in fact killed. Um, and in the period that he was captured, he wrote memoirs while in jail, basically detailing exactly what he did and talking about the fact that he was still a respectable human being, that he was a respectable person, he was true to his children and his nation and his country and his religion, um, that he was still an honorable person, um, despite his job. And his job, very much like Eichmann, was just a job. It was nothing more than that. So this photo album shows uh, Karl Hacher among his superiors. Uh, basically, uh, him among these uh, other superiors, 
And uh, in a kind of bizarre, almost surreal kind of parallel world that they, that they lived in, this moving between the world of Auschwitz, all the horror, the death, the destruction, the genocide, and this other life world where they could enjoy themselves, fraternize, talk, sing, play, eat, uh, do whatever, whatever they needed to do. Here they are, uh, Harry, I mean, it really, I mean, he's, he's a happy guy. I mean, almost flirtatious, right? Uh, almost, almost so, on a, on a bus. This, I think, is one of the most extraordinary pictures or this group of pictures from the, from the album. I mean, something that you wouldn't even conceive of because how would you know what the SS officers were doing on their off hours? What were they doing? Uh, they were lounging on chairs on a deck. In this case, one's playing an accordion, another, another's laying down here. Uh, this is Carl Hawker among the female auxiliaries. He's, he had passed out blueberries. Uh, they were all eating blueberries out of a little bowl. Um, and so what they're doing is they're, they're eating blueberries uh, while you have simultaneously the machinery of a genocide uh, just churning away. It's like, how do you understand these two things? They're 15 miles apart, but yet they're a complete eternity and world apart. It's like almost like a parallel life, right? It's almost like during the day one thing, during the night something else, right? This is almost like this, the everyday life of a Nazi officer working in Auschwitz at the very moment that Elie Wiesel and Primo Levi are there, at the moment when all the Hungarian Jews are sent to Auschwitz, at the moment it's operating at its highest capacity, and he's eating blueberries. Passing out blueberries. There they are. It's enjoyable. So how do you, I mean, just to kind of conclude some of our conversation today, I mean, how do we understand, I mean, this world? I mean, how do we understand, what do we learn about uh, who is Karl Hocher? I mean, what kind of person is he? How do we understand, uh, say, a Nazi officer in this context, knowing what we know also about Auschwitz? How do we understand these two worlds? I mean, do they, do they go together? Are they antithetical? Are they pieces, you know, two sides of the same coin? How do you, how do you eat blueberries and murder millions of people? How, how, do they, how do you justify or bring together these two things? Ideas? What do you think? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, even, I mean, one of the extraordinary things that's in here is that, that funeral for Nazi officials who were killed um, in the so-called terror on Griff when the, there, were, there was a, a bombing took place and a number of Nazi officers died. Uh, that was a very moving thing because human beings had been killed there. This is basically, for, in the perspective of Karl Hocker, these are human beings that have been killed. They were Nazis. What he was doing, I think you're exactly right, is they weren't killing human beings. They were doing something else. Um, and in many ways, there's this radical dissociation about what counted as human. Nazis counted as human. This is a portrait of humans who died. The Nazis are not portraying human death because they're not interested in Jews dying. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that becomes I mean, a very profoundly you know, difficult uh, connection. I mean, it's one that I think we ought to make. I mean, there's no question. And I think the connection is to be found in mass death. That is to say, the, the issue of the atomic bombing and comparisons with the Holocaust. I mean, it's a profoundly 
it's both a philosophical, but I think it's a moral issue that we, we do want to confront and we should confront. Um, it's not in the context of this class right now that we can easily do so. But I think one of the things they have in common, and I think that Hannah Arendt would support this, is the issue of mass death, right? Death that's not done individually, but it's done large, anonymously, and it's also done through technology, uh, instrumentalized technology to get rid of, annihilate, completely ruin the traces of individuals. Um, that they have in common. Um, certainly the history, the motivations and things would need to be differentiated. Um, and not to say that they're not points of similarity, but they're also significant points of difference. And those would have to be, you know, we have to articulate them. Other comments? Hmm? So the differentiation of their life essentially was in some ways the coping mechanism. Yeah, I mean, I, I gave you on the web links for the class I mean, a link to a speech by, uh, by Himmler uh, that he gave in 1943. And although I'm not going to have time to talk about it, one of the things that he does is he tells the officers who are used to seeing thousands of corpses a day, and some of them were profoundly affected by this. Some did go crazy because, I mean, you know, if you're not used to that, and no one could have been used to that, how do, you, how, do you, how do you steal yourself? How do you become callous, right? How do you cope with something as horrific as seeing thousands of corpses a day? And he tells them that you have to become hard. You have to become Germans. You have to keep your honor. You have to keep working. Uh, you're doing something for a greater good. You're doing something for a greater Germany. You're doing something for the world. And he basically tries to give them a pep talk to essentially do that. Keep your life, your work that you're doing here separate from your life because your life is about your dignity and your humanity, and your work is basically you're just carrying out a task. Um, and the task is, I mean, and it's not just a task, it's a task that's gonna do a greater good, at least in the Nazi world view, right? It's a task of, of purging, which they thought was an essential task. Other thoughts, yeah? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, one of the issues was, I mean, there is a kind of, uh, and this goes to that issue of the bureaucracy of the killing, right, is that it wasn't like one person was involved in every stage, right? So it's not like one, the same person rounded up the Jews, put them in trains, brought them for selection, uh, put them, you know, in gas chambers, dropped the Zyklon B, cleaned out the gas chambers, burned their bodies. Right? One person didn't do all those phases or all those steps. Instead, it's broken down into many discrete, fragmented uh, steps. And what that also means is that you have a, this, again, you have this very large, horizontal, differentiated, bureaucratic system in which one person is playing, every person plays an important role, but no person plays all the roles. Right? And that also is what mean, that also is what presented a legal challenge for how to deal with human agency. So it's like, what role did you play in carrying this out, right? If you were not the person who dropped the Zyklon B, can you have been, can you be guilty? Can you stand trial for murder? Um, and so, and the answer was yes, because there were issues about aiding and abetting genocide, which became central um, to the conceptualization of carrying out a genocide. It wasn't just, and this goes to Hannah Arendt, you know, what meaning does murder have when you're talking about the mass production of corpses? You almost need new concepts, and you also need new legal standards to understand and adjudicate these crimes. Uh, and I think that's, that's certainly at stake for, for what we're talking about here. Other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, that's always so striking to me is that I, I suppose you want, I don't know about you, but uh, maybe I had wanted the Nazis to be somehow 
distinctly different. So that is to say, I, I, I consumed by some kind of hatred of, not, of somehow have, having maybe compromised something about their humanity. And what you find is that they're profoundly human. Uh, and they're profoundly all too human. And, and, uh, and I think it's this, this example here, the, the, the blueberries to me. It's that uh, you can partake, you can fraternize, you can sing, you can have music, you can enjoy yourself, you can do all those things that, that we associate with our, our humanity, our enjoyment, uh, our kind of kindness to others, laughing. Uh, that you can do all those things and simultaneously commit a genocide. That they're not separate things, they're not separate spheres, they're not antithetical. They're both potentialities, probably, of, of anyone. And that's the problem, right? That, that's the, that's, that's the, also the horror, I guess. All right, so, um, yeah, let's, let's end it there. I mean, I think we'll, we'll end. <laughs>